Howdy everybody, this is my first video on the Anchor Toasting channel, and I am the CEO of Anchor Toasting. I wrote up this short little article to show you guys how to start your own Rust server if you want to self-host it on your Windows PC, or you're running a virtual or dedicated instance of Windows in the cloud. You can absolutely follow this tutorial as well, as long as you uh, remote desktop into that instance. So the first thing we're going to do is go to the article, it should be linked in the description. And then we're going to want to click this to go to the Steam CMD uh, website and we're going to want to download Steam CMD. I already have, but once you have, you're going to want to extract it. After you extract it, you should just have the Steam CMD file right here. You won't have this Rust install or, or update uh, batch file, but you can get, grab this right here and we can create it. All you have to do is make a text document and I will show you right now. We'll go to new text document. We can call this install. And then after we have the show file extensions, you'll just name it bat. And you can click confirm. We'll want to go to view. And if you didn't see the file extensions, you can just click it right here, the check mark. From there, you'll want to go to a text editor. You can use Notepad. In this case, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code just because what I prefer. We can throw it in here and we can grab uh, our little Steam CMD install. And we're going to put this in a file called Rust Server at the base of our C drive. So we'll just paste this in, make sure that we do have a directory at the base of our C drive called Rust Server. I'll show you guys how to do that shortly but we'll just have to save this first and then we will go into the base of our C drive right here. We will click new and folder and we will want to make a folder called Rust server. Try to refrain from putting spaces as it makes it a little bit harder. I just call it Rust server like that. We can use capital letters, it's absolutely okay. After we have that, we're prepared to run the script and we're prepared to run the executable to actually install CMD. So let's head back to our Steam CMD directory right here and let's run the Steam CMD installer, the executable that we unzipped earlier. After it shows all this and we get prompted with the Steam uh, and the carrot, we will go back and we can close out of this. Now with the installation uh, batch file that we created earlier, we can just simply run this. And this will actually install all the crucial files that we need into the Rust server directory that we just created at the base of our C drive. Now that we get a success message, we know that if we go back to our Rust server directory right here, we should see all of these files. Now we're gonna want, once we have all this, we're gonna want to create a new text document again. And this was gonna be another batch file. I'm just gonna call it start.batch right here. We can use the abbreviation bat and we're going to want to throw this into our text editor again and go back to my article right here and we're going to want to copy all this a lot of this stuff besides like the rcom password some of the networking information can be put in the server.cfg but since it's a lot of the crucial information i just put it into my start.batch anyway for my startup uh configured variables we're gonna to want to use the uh, up caret if we're going to want to go to a new line. Usually all this can be done in one line, but if you want to signal it to be on the next line, you're gonna to want to do a space and then an up character. Or I guess this would be the power symbol. We wanna save that and we can go back to our Rust server directory and we can run the start.bat uh, batch file and then it should start our Rust server theoretically. Now we just need to wait for it to uh, start up. It can take a significant amount of time to actually start and get ready for us, but that doesn't typically matter too much. It could be up to like 10 minutes in some cases. While that's starting, I just wanted to go over some of these crucial uh, startup variables that we have here, the console variables. So server.level, this will be a procedural generation if this is labeled to procedural map. Otherwise, you can label it as like a custom map. The server port, this is the default server port uh, that Rust uses. We'll also have a query port that we can specify if you'd like. So uh, default, it will be 
one above or whichever one of the server ports or the Archon port is higher, it will be one above that. So in this case, it's gonna be 28017. We can also specify this. We can do minus query port and 28017, and we can force it to be uh, the query port to be 28017 like so, and we can also save it. But default, it will be 28017 with this config. Now, keep in mind that if you're running this on a home network, you're going to want to port forward these ports back to your the, the internal subnet IP of your PC, such that these ports, whenever they enter your public IP of your residence, they will be sent to your computer. Now we have the server.c, this is just a randomizer. We have the world size, so the actual size, 4,000 is quite large. Typically people like around 3,000 for a small server. This is the max players you'll be able to have on the server. We got our host name, so this is the name it would appear in the server list, the description of the server list. Whenever you click on the visit website link in the server list, this is where it'll send you. The header image, this is going to have to be specified as 512 pixels by 256 pixels in height. The server.identity, this will be the, uh, when we go into our rest server directory, you see the server tab, we can go to the server, CFG, and we can actually make the server.cfg here. And this can contain the extra console variables that will run on startup. So these console variables are executed after the start.bat startup variables, because these run when after your server gets up and running. This also includes being after the server auto.cfg. The server auto, we would want those variables to be overridden by the server.cfg. And we can create that right here, a new text document, and we can create a server.config, so cfg. A lot of times if you do uh, save the state of your server, which we have a save interval, usually it's about 600 seconds by default, it will make a server.cfg. Now continuing on this, we have the Archon password. You need to specify this in the start.batch file. Currently it's just let me in, but you can specify this as any and it will stay that until you restart your server. And this is just saying archon.web that we are enabling Archon on the web interface so we can visit it on 28016. Now our server is almost done setting up. It is just generating the map terrain. It's, this is quite a large map at uh, 4,000 size. So it will take a second and the monuments are going to take it one or two seconds to build. Now in the meantime, I'm going to boot up Rust such that I can show you guys how to connect to the server. Uh, we're going to be using localhost since this is within the same PC that I am starting the server from. But if it's not, you got, I can show you guys how to connect to it if it's going to be a remote IP as well. Keep in mind, for when we're starting this, it's going to use up a, a base about 8 gigabytes of RAM. So if you are buying remote hosting or whatnot, like Anchored Hosting offers, you'll need about 8 gigs of RAM to start this. So to connect to our server, we're going to want to type connect into the console and then if this is local we can use localhost this will use the one dot or one two seven dot subnet uh and that will be on our local instance and then 28015 this is the game port to the server not the query port instead of localhost you'll want to use the public ip of your like home residence and you should have already port forward 28015 to your PC as well as 28016 and 28017 and 28082, which is the default Rust Plus app port. Now we can connect to it here and we should be able to join the server. All right, now that we're connecting to the server, I wanted to show you guys how you can know that the server is finally already started up. So if we look in the console, you should be able to see the name of the server, the FPS is running at and all of these, uh, this information and you will be uh, a okay to be able to connect to our server. I also wanted to show you guys a little bit of information about how we can actually see this local instance in the server list and a little bit of information about the query port. So if we go to Steam, we will be able to go to the view and then the servers tab. This should bring up a list of the servers that we have in favorites. I'm just going to add localhost, and then we're gonna add the query port. 
We're going to want to add the query port because the query port is the one that actually sends the crucial information like the host name, the header image, uh, link and whatnot in this packet that is from the source query. Right now it is being forced onto a separate port just because that's how Steamworks does it to get the query information from a different port as it's a different protocol. But sometimes if you're using RackNet or you used to be able to force it onto the same port as the game port, but that is no more. It's proper practice to have this onto a separate port. So we can add this address to favorites and when we go into our favorites, we should be able to see this uh, server and I'll show you guys that shortly. Now we've loaded up just right into the server we just started because we direct connected it to it. We're not going to be able to see the information right here because we didn't use the query port. But if we go to play games and favorites, we should be able to see it right here. So the name of the server as shown on the client server list, that's what we called our server. And if we click it, we're going to be able to see the information that uh, we just put entered in here. Now this can be quite uh, complicated and you don't necessarily get protection when you're setting this up. And enabling port forwarding on your home network isn't necessarily the best solution. So if you are looking for a more managed, easier solution, then you can check out some of the anchored hosting, uh, Rust hosting options. We use Linux on the Pterodactyl panel and uh, you can just go, it should be on the bottom of the article and you can view some of the plans we have for what type of server you're looking to set up.